thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone yeah, for coming to this uh, workshop, making this uh, such an interesting event. And uh, as Sasha said before, yeah, and uh, Adrian, really hope to stimulate some uh, 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 interesting discussions in the next few uh, today and tomorrow in the next few days. Yeah, and you, uh, I hope you can enjoy this very much yeah, and take some information out of these uh, discussions. Yeah. So now I would like to take the opportunity yeah, to connect the actual basic information, the fundamental aspects uh, that was uh, Sasha describing in the previous minutes. Yeah, now to connect this to the uh, 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 to the program for the rest of the day of to and tomorrow. Yeah, so to say, to connect the fundamental aspects now with uh, some application examples uh, uh, to the. Um, to the presentations and the different talks that are uh, 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 coming up in the rest of the program. So the idea is now to show you some a few initial results, yeah, to see what kind of systems configuration you can use and what kind of results can be actually obtained. So basically, what Sasha mentioned is, or pointed out in quite uh, nice detail, is that we use this kind of system configuration that we illuminate the AFM probing tip with the help of this parabolic mirror. But now we actually can use an interferometer uh, or an interferometric detection principle to measure the amplitude in the face of the scattered light, yeah, which is related to the reflection and the absorption of the uh, measured sample uh, materials. And on top of this, you can actually couple different kind of sources to this interferometer. In the course, or in the, in the last few years, actually we have been quite successful to address different kind of system configurations or different kind of sources that are connected to this uh, interferometric uh, uh, setup. Yeah? So in the next few minutes, I uh, just would like to show you a few examples that are based on uh, single frequency lasers, mostly in the mid IR range based on quantum cascade lasers, but also some examples for spectroscopic applications. But the first question you would like to ask yourself is, uh, now, if you really illuminate this AFM tip here, how good does it really work? What's the performance of the instrument? Yeah? How much you can really go down in resolution? And one very nice initial example is already shown here that we uh, would like to discuss with you. Uh, namely, what it is, it, it's an interface between a BMMA and a polycarbonate uh, 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 Polymers, yeah, and the sample was prepared in some sort of cross-section and then more or less decently polished. And the nice thing is now if we use the spectroscopic information measured as a function of the tip location while this tip is scanning across this interface, you see very nicely for the area of the PMMA here very pronounced the carbonyl peak here around 7050 or 7060 wave numbers. And as soon as the tip uh, crosses this boundary uh, and uh, reaches the polycarbonate area, the spectroscopic signature actually is changing. So to say within this interface, you see that within a distance of 10 or 20 uh, nanometers, so to say within two or three uh, pixels distance, yeah, the signature really changes, for example, here, from uh, this frequency here to 70, 80 wave numbers, for example, for the polycarbonate. Now, the nice aspect here is, since we don't see any crosstalk here of these uh, uh, signatures, of these absorption lines, yeah, we can really state that the spatial resolution is given by the size of the AFM tip. Otherwise, you would see here at the interface some sort of mixture of the two signatures. But obviously, this is missing here. So this is already the first proof that for the spectroscopic measurement, we are also really achieving a spatial resolution that's given only by the size of the AFM tip. Now, the second aspect is that we want to highlight is the actual um, confinement of the light around the probing tip is, of course, uh, 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 determining the spatial resolution. But obviously, the confinement of light is also very high in vertical dimensions. So we always like to say that actually we have a very high surface sensitivity. Good. In order to prove this, what we actually measured in uh, collaboration with uh, Magnus, yeah, uh, is a, 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 a copper surface that was covered by ODT. ODT is a nice molecule for this because it's only a two nanometer long molecule that's highly oriented on the surface. Yeah? And now if you place the tip on different locations, we very nicely see here in the range between 1400 and 50, 1500 wave numbers the spectroscopic signature of the molecule. If you compare our measurement, yeah, so to say the non FTR absorption with a reference uh, spectra you can take from literature, the signature agrees very well. Obviously, yeah, the spectra also shows some uh, uh, limitations already in sensitivity, or so to say that we are at the limit what can be detected. But nevertheless, I think we can clearly state that we are able to detect this two nanometer small molecule on the surface. The next aspect that's really nice is because the OD2 is actually used as some sort of uh, um, protection coating for the copper surface, and if uh, 
the copper actually is uh, corroding. Additional peaks here around 1600 wave numbers would actually occur, but since we don't see this, we can also already verify that the uh, coating, the protection coating for the, for the surface is actually functional and the, pro and the surface is uh, protected from corrosion. So, we do not only achieve a very high spatial resolution, but we can also state that we have really a very high surface sensitivity for the technology. So, this uh, is for the spectroscopic measurements. Now, if we switch the measurement mode to single frequencies to measurements with the quantum cascade laser, what we can uh, measure here is uh, what you see in the optical microscope is a cross-sectional sample pre prepared from some... Uh, standard packaging mat material that you have for vegetables, for example. Yeah? Typically, these materials are made of, out of about 500 nanometer thin uh, uh, polyethylene uh, layers, yeah? and these layers are glued together by polyamide. Now, if you tune the system to be sensitive to the polyamide here around 1660 wave numbers, you really nicely see that the uh, absorption image here shows very strongly highlighted these gluing layers. Whereas if you go off resonance, the sensitivity is really lost and you don't see these layers anymore. So that means the combination uh, of these images at these two frequencies really highlights we do measure a pure optical effect. And moreover, if you extract a line profile across the images, that you really achieve a really nanoscale spatial resolution. So the full width half maximum of this liner here in the center, for example, amounts only to 30 nanometers. So we really, again, verify the spatial resolution. What we achieve is given only by the size of the AFM tip. Now, in the next few minutes, based on these results, you can apply uh, this concept or the system to different kinds of, um, different kinds of uh, classes of materials. Yeah? Obviously, this is what we are going to hear in the next uh, few hours uh, continuously from different uh, contribu uh, contributions. However, now I just would like to give you like two or three examples coming from the field of polymers or life science, and probably, if you have time, also some uh, measurement examples in the range of, uh, from the range of semiconductors. So the first example I would like to highlight a little bit is really connected to uh, real-world problems. So basically what we, every one of us has is uh, this conventional uh, tire like we have for cars and so on. Yeah? It's a very interesting material system because you have different types of materials in this, uh, uh, in, uh, in this tire. Yeah? So actually uh, a large fraction of these um, uh, materials used for the tires is made out of uh, natural rubber, silicon oxide, or also some uh, butadiene rubber, yeah, and you have some additional components, yeah. And typically what uh, people are doing is they, in order to investigate these materials, they prepare some cross-sections, yeah. Now if you prepare such a cross-section, you take an AFM map, you see the polishing is quite okay, but obviously what you do not have is any information at all what's the nanoscale distribution of the materials. However, what you can do is you can go to uh, literature, look up the infrared spectra of these different materials, yeah, and then just take simultaneously to the AFM map, take different uh, uh, maps at, uh, or take maps at different frequencies. And this is actually what's shown here. So we took at a specific wavelength here uh, that are sensitive to the natural rubber or to the silicon oxide here around 1100 wave numbers, and then color-coded the infrared images and created some sort of compo compositional map. And within this map, yeah, it's really obvious that you have uh, areas where mostly the red particles light up, like the butadiene rubber, or mostly the green areas where you have the silicon oxide present. So within this compositional map, immediately the distribution of the materials is present, as well as the interaction or the, 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 the nanoscale distribution or the uh, chemical interaction of the different materials. Because what's really interesting is that you also find some regions where you have a mixture of the different colors. Yeah? So here you have more like a purple region, or uh, in, in, in these kind of particles, yeah, you have, uh, so to say, different uh, materials present at the same time. So you can really analyze this in great detail, not only the distribution of the materials, but you can also immediately do some statistical analysis, so to say, what's the typical particle diameter or the total area, uh, what they uh, actually cover in this material, and also, so to say, the particle-to-particle -particle distance. Yeah? And this is exactly the information that the engineers would like to know because these are determining the macroscopic behaviors of the, f of the final, the resulting material. So this is really critical information. Um, another example I quickly want to highlight is more in the, related to the field of life science. So what we actually looked at is a cross-sectional sample made out of E. coli bacteria. And this is a very inter interesting material system because it could include, uh, contain some inclusion bodies. So to say this means uh, protein-rich regions, yeah? So here what you see in the light microscope image is, uh, 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 again, a cross-sectional sample where uh, a lot of these uh, E. coli bacteria actually cross-sectioned. 
And uh, this is a very interesting material system, not only because it uh, supports the diagnosis of some various diseases. This is particularly interesting because some people think this might really offer some new opportunities in the production of antibodies, which is a super critical uh, process for the, uh, for the development of, fu uh, of future cancer th therapies. Yeah? So routinely what people do is they have these inclusion bodies and then they look at these structures with the help of an electron microscope or with the help of the fluorescence. And if you have uh, the, uh, uh, the actual proteins uh, labeled, yeah, you have these fluorescence uh, uh, signals coming from the inclusion bodies. However, if we now take a map on this cross-sectional sample, you see the uh, surface preparation is kind of decent, but immediately you see on the near-field uh, uh, amplitude image that you have regions in the, in, inside these uh, 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 cross-sectional E. coli uh, uh, areas yeah, where you have a high reflectivity. So, and if you have a closer look, you can really see that these kind of structures correspond very nicely to the expected results coming from electron microscopy, for example. However, the story becomes really interesting. Now, with our nano-FTR uh, nano technology, you can, you can really identify the conform conformational status of the proteins inside these inclusion bodies. So very nicely, you see, if you go to these bright areas, you can see the signature of the amide bands, whereas if you go to the different regions inside this E. coli, you see mostly the signature of the cytoplasm, or even in the embedding uh, polymer, yeah, you also don't see these uh, characteristic amide band signature. So with the help of our technology, we can really confirm that mostly in these inclusion bodies, we have a better sheet structure. And this is, of course, the super critical information when you uh, want to process uh, the proteins in the, in, in, in the development of uh, or the analysis of uh, the aforementioned applications. A different type of application I quickly want to highlight is then uh, related not only to the nano-FTR measurements, what we discussed so far. So here again is a quick outline of the beam path concept. So we have the AFM tip illuminated with the parabolic mirror. And then the design of the instrument allows not only to couple the Smith infrared components to the AFM probing tip, but to have a second optical beam port that can be used for different type of setups. Yeah? So one type of uh, development we have been uh, uh, doing or investing a lot of resources in the last few months is then related to the fact that we want to, to measure the inelastic light scattering from the, uh, coming from the tip yeah, by using for the detection a spectrometer. And basically what this is uh, enabling is uh, uh, the realization of doing tip-enhanced Raman spectroscopy measurements. Yeah? That this kind of system is functional is proven by the fact that we have quite some contributions uh, in, this, uh, in this workshop here related to this kind of system configuration. A proof of concept also comes by the fact that by doing a measurement on this uh, standard sample, which in this case is a commercial Nile blue sample, if you place the tip on different locations, on a random location here marked by blue, you see very nicely the characteristic uh, Raman uh, lines of the Nile blue, whereas if you go to this contamination particle with a diameter of about 200 nanometers, you see that the signature is almost completely lost. So we can really state again here, based on these aspects, that you uh, can do some tip-enhanced measurements. However, what I would like to highlight now is, compared to the more dedicated talks, is that this can be really combined with infrared spectroscopy. And in order to do this, what we prepared is also some sort of uh, standard sample made out of uh, paracetamol. This is nice, a uh, nice material system because uh, if you look up uh, uh, references or literature, you very easily find uh, reference infrared and the Raman spectra, and uh, the sample material was easy to prepare. You just mill it and then you s dissolve it in some water and you drop cast this on a surface. You take an AFM map, you see the average roughness is about 160 nanometers, and now if you place the tip on such a particle, you see very nicely on the one hand side the characteristic nano-FTR spectrum, here in this frequency range provided by the laser source used for the measurement, you see a very nice agreement between the conventional absorption spectrum and the non-FTR absorption spectrum. So the agreement in terms of absolute peak height or uh, frequencies of the absorption lines is very nice. But on top of this, if you switch the mode, you can also now detect actually the Raman spectrum in this uh, frequency range here from about 600 wave numbers down to 2200 wave numbers. And again, yeah, you see very nicely the agreement is there. Yeah, you see the spectral resolution for our tip-enhanced Raman measurements is slightly lower, but the overall agreement is just wonderful. Yeah? So that means with this combination, we can now really state you can correlate infrared and Raman spectroscopic information now on the nanoscale. 
to uh, come to the last exa uh, uh, application examples from the field of semiconductors, I quickly highlight uh, the capabilities, what we can do when we integrate a terahertz time domain spectrometer in our system. This is again very easy because, uh, again, uh, a critical aspect is the fact that uh, the AFM tip can be illuminated with the help of our objective from two different directions. So that means it's very easy to have an antenna structure acting as a source on one side, do the tip scattering and then detect the scattered lights here on the other side. So the, uh, the integration of the TDS system is really easy. Um, on the other hand, this opens up the opportunity uh, to do either spectroscopic measurements by measuring the transient in the uh, frequency range given by the TDS system. Alternatively, what you can also do is you can just stop the delay at a certain time where you have some sort of maximum interference signal and then you can create some sort of intensity maps for this uh, frequency range that's kind of averaged or integrated here in the tera uh, terahertz wavelength. Based on this, uh, we verified the performance of this instrument here by looking at the test structure that was uh, made or provided by IMEC. Actually, this is uh, a very nice sample because it's a doping staircase that contains very well-defined uh, 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 concentrations of free carriers in about one micrometer wide uh, uh, liners, yeah? and you have sharp interfaces between the liners. So here again, we have a cross-sectional sample. Here you see uh, the topographic feature of the uh, uh, gluing edge that was used for the sample preparation. And then fr fr uh, uh, from this uh, edge, you have different layers yeah, containing different concentrations of free carriers. Now, if you use the terahertz system to, uh, to map this area, we see very nicely that the highest, most uh, doped regions reveal a very high contrast. If we compare this with model calculations, we are exactly here in this frequency range. You see that the, for these high carrier concentrations, we expect a high reflectivity, whereas for these slowly doped regions with the reflectivity actually should be decreased. If we do a control measurement here at infrared frequencies, we see that we actually uh, uh, should be sensitive only to the highest doping concentration, which is nicely confirmed. And even more, if we go to a visible frequency range, yeah, which means we go all the way this way, the sensitivity to uh, the local conductivity should be completely gone. And this is exactly what's confirmed in the measurement. If we now move to the um, um, uh, 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 more interesting sample, we can look at the semiconductor device structure. Actually, in this case, it's an FSRAM device structure, and now we can apply this uh, concept to map the different regions of this device. We can compare the infrared and the terahertz image. Uh, obviously, we see for the infrared image that these kind of structures uh, uh, are really metallic, very highly conductive, whereas in the terahertz image, we can also highlight these uh, features here uh, in this sample region. The interesting aspect is now we can, with the comparison of these two images, we can kind of quantify the free carrier concentration, but it's extremely difficult to learn about what's the polarity, so to say other regions are actually P-doped or N-doped. But in order to, to, to investigate this, we can actually make use out of the um, uh, aspect that we uh, have a fully functional AFM, which means we can switch the AFM mode operation to uh, measure the electro electrostatic force between the tip and the sample when we bias the sample. And based on this, you can see that you can really create a very strong contrast for these doped regions. And based on this, we can identify that these upper parts of the sample area are actually P-doped, whereas the lower regions are actually N-doped. So the combination of the infrared or the optical response together with the standard AFM information really helps to fully characterize these device structures. With this, I think I skipped the last slide. Uh, I already would like to um, thank you for the attention, and I'm really looking forward for the next few talks where we can see a lot of more of the different applications. Thank you very much.